In this week's episode of Horses Explained, we will be exploring mare and stallion reproductive systems, how reproductive hormones can influence a horse's behaviour, and what welfare-focused management of mares and stallions looks like with equine vet and reproduction specialist James Crabtree. So James, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be discussing the reproductive system, and so in terms of mares and stallions, what are the key features of the reproductive systems? Well, I suppose uh, the key features depend on what you comparing it to. So I work with horses all the time. Um, the key features of the, the stallions are that probably maybe even relates more to behavioral aspects. You know, in the wild, horses live in large groups. You've got a dominant stallion, um, you, which we often refer to as a harem stallion. You've got groups of colts which we refer to as bachelor stallions mm -hmm. and then we've got groups of mares and so the the key features of the reproductive system are very much geared around that as a primary sort of that's how they mm -hmm. are and that's how they behave um, the stallions produce lots of semen when they breed the mares um, natural cover obviously we think about how it's done naturally mm -hmm. and horses breed numerous times in any given cycle and then that's all controlled by the receptivity of the mare. So then the key feature of the mare is that she has a cycle which is approximately 21 to 23 days in length. Mm -hmm. They're out of season for approximately 14, 15 days. They're in season for approximately a week. And they're in standing heat, so when they would then approach the stallion and, and stand for him, for maybe two, three, four days sometimes just only for a short period of time. So the system is all built around the behavioral aspects and the fact that they originate um, in a evolutionary sense, they've come from that background and so everything's geared around that. And how do the hormones influence the reproduction and behavior of the horses? They are ultimately the primary driver. So um, the stallion's got testosterone, which drives his sexual behaviors um, but there is a cyclical thing that goes on in the stallions as well as the mares but if I start with the stallion so they will they can breed all year round but there's a, a natural phase which is all related to the gestation period of the mare so they um, generally go a little bit quieter over the winter which is paralleled in the mares and then their main activity peaks in the spring and then in the summer and that's all related to the gestation period of the mare. So she, the gestation period is 340 days. And so if you want to deliver a foal, mm -hmm. when things are, when the environment like today is good, preferably when the grass is growing, um, and then the environment is good for delivering your foal, you need to be a long day breeder. So they, they start their reproductive activity when the days are getting longer. So Naturally speaking, certainly in the north of England, they'll probably spontaneously start uh, ovulating in about the middle of April. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite late. People think that your breeding season a starts earlier, sooner than yeah. that, which it does, because we tend to manipulate it a little bit. Um, so then hormones and cyclic activity starts happening in the vast majority of mares. And when they are, the main driver is actually progesterone. So progesterone is the hormone which keeps the mare pregnant but the progesterone is what keeps the mare out of season so when a mare ovulates she forms a structure called the corpus luteum which produces progesterone which if the mare has been bred will then support the pregnancy if the mare is regardless of whether she's been bred or not that progesterone drives the behavior that which makes them sort of resist mm -hmm. approach from the stallion so it's not, a, it wouldn't view it as, as a negative hormone, it just means that there's, there's no driver for them to be receptive to the stallion. If the mare's not been bred and she comes to the end of that phase, she'll come into season and that's what we call the follicular phase mm -hmm. and that's where oestrogen predominates. And oestrogen is the female hormone that drives reproductive behavior and so that will cause the mare to be more receptive to stallion's advances and to even hunt out the stallion and encourage the advance from the stallion. So then the mare will ovulate and then that cycle will start all over again. So it's a fine balance between progesterone and oestrogen. I see. And then you touched, I'm going to say briefly there on geography. Would you say that the sort of hormonal and like seasonal reproductive changes 
across the country are different? Does it change over the course of the year? Does it? Yeah, very, very slightly. It's driven by light. Light is the biggest driver. So light comes into the eye, is sensed by the eye. That's then translated via the pineal gland or the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin. Mm -hmm. And that melatonin level is the controller of the reproductive cycle. Now, we don't, there's lots of factors that cause the stimulation of reproductive cyclic activity. Mm -hmm. Melatonin levels are the primary driver, but there's other things like stress, body condition, social stresses, physical stresses can all contribute to when a mare actually will start cycling. In fact, there are a lot of mares that are in good management, they're kept warm during the winter, they're fed well. They don't necessarily experience the same negative influences as wild horses would in the wild. And actually, some of those horses will cycle all year round or they'll have a very short period of inactivity around November, December, January, where they actually do shut down. No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and so how can we manage horses whilst considering how their reproductive hormones affect how they're feeling? That's a very good question. So I could turn that on its head and say a lot of the problems that as we as veterinarians in clinical practice um, deal with uh, is the undesirable reproductive behaviours. And actually, um, people always assume that their mare is difficult because she's in season yeah. and actually that's not always the case. Um, sometimes a mare can be a little bit more receptive to instruction, ridden, work, mm -hmm. maybe even quieter on the ground when she is in season and can be a little bit more awkward and a bit more resistant when she's out of season. So there's two elements going on is what is undesirable is it the pure behavior and the hormones mm. that are driving that or is it the fact that actually when she's in season she stops out of outside every stable and wants to squat and pee which is normal reproductive behavior actually it's just undesirable to many people to humans yeah, yeah. to humans but it is actually normal physiology and i see ranges of of, of, of concerns from horse owners. Some people think that their horse is in pain. Mm -hmm. And of course, then we've got the anthropomorphism that, you know, it's very difficult, diffi different to the human cycle. Um, some women can feel painful around ovulation. And then we, some people, men and women included, assume that the horse does as well. And so it can be very complex in trying to figure it out because we can't talk to them and ask. No, for sure. Yeah. And would you say that there is an understanding around the pain levels of a mare who would be in season? Do we know what that no, is like? No, no, absolutely not. We don't know. <laughs> and, and we don't know how to assess that either. I mean, there are lots of, um, for those that don't know, there are sorts of visual assessment mm -hmm. scales that you can use to assess pain level. They're called a pain ethogram. And there, there isn't one on the back of oestrogen to understand whether a mare is in discomfort or not. They do lots of strange positions and they act very differently. Mm. And, and a lot of owners don't necessarily understand that. Um, and part of my job in trying to find a solution for those clients is actually quite complex. And it's, it's about understanding the owner's perception mm. of the horse as much as it is as trying to determine whether the horse has got a problem. That they're feeling uncomfortable, for example. Perfect. And so in terms of minimising stress for the mare during pregnancy, how, how important is that? And then on the back of that, how important is it to minimise stress during the weaning process? Okay, so stress is, off, is very important. Um, stress through in the wild would cause elevation in cortisol levels. Um, the equine pregnancy is actually quite a secure thing. Once the mare gets pregnant, Yes, mares can lose pregnancies, and we know that quite a lot of that is through genetic abnormality and, and other issues. But once the mare actually conceives and forms a pregnancy in the womb, there are lots of physiological mechanisms that try and secure that. And there's a lot of perception that stress can cause abortion. And actually there's very little evidence to support that. Um, what I would say is that a horse that is stressed we maybe are learning now in the last 10 and even five years that, that stresses on the individual actually affects the genetic expression of the offspring, it, the epigenetic factors. So it's really important to minimise those stressful things as well as, as well as the physical stresses, mm -hmm. you know, poor nutrition and all those types of things. But the, from the point of view of the pregnancy, that is usually pretty resilient 
to external stresses. And then weaning, obviously there's a long way between pregnancy yeah. and weaning, but weaning is, is, a, is a very difficult stage because it is a very strong bond between mother and foal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trying to then separate them to um, fit into the normal way of management of horses, mm -hmm. domesticated horses, yeah. is quite a challenge. Of course, I keep going back to the wild because it's, it's the reference point. If you go back to the wild, the mare would conceive again and, and then she would have another foal and she would have pushed the, um, her offspring away, but they would have been in a big group. So that would then go off and explore and would, would make friends with other horses and would, depending on whether that was a, a, a filly or a colt, would probably go off in different directions. And they would also have a lot more education and interaction with other horses and, and learn how to behave, learn the signals which mean don't come near me, learn the signals which say yes, you can approach. Um, and so there isn't much education has gone on in the domesticated situation around weaning. And of course, there's very high injury rates around weaning when either mother is trying to get back to foal or foal is trying to get back to its mother. So trying to keep all of that smooth mm. so that you don't leave mental scars on the, on, the, on the foal and the mare is important. And there's lots of different opinions and strategies on how one can achieve that. No, for sure. And I think it's so important that we are able to recognise and maintain where possible as, you know, natural practice as possible. And yes. actually, this is what they would experience in the wild. And yes, you know, they will have to fit into the domestic format that they're in at the time. But actually, we can reduce stress so much. Yes. By following those yeah. instinctive practices that they actually follow, and the the biggest thing is for the for the weaned individuals, whether that be mother or foal, mm -hmm. to have some companionship from others, and um, that can make a big difference. And but I do appreciate that people don't always have access to those yeah. options. No, for sure. And so, in terms of welfare-friendly management strategies, what can we consider for stallions and broodmares? Well, the, the subject around the stallion is, is, is quite a hot topic at the moment. So stallions, generally speaking, we regard them as strong, dominant, and sometimes animals that can be a bit dangerous because they've got lots of testosterone and that, that, that gives them a lot of sexual aggression. Um, however, stallions can settle into environments with other horses very well. So there's this perception that they are dangerous and they need to be kept individual. Um, and also protected because they're fearful that the stallion is going to get kicked and if he's very valuable because he's got val valuable genetics it's this human nature to want to sort of bring them away and protect them actually we know that they really benefit from social contact and touch um, co-grazing with other horses um, co-grazing with other species, um, physical contact um, in this, not only just physical contact in the field, but maybe even physical contact in stabling. And there's a lot of work that's come out of Europe looking at different stabling options. So at the moment, um, that information is growing, mm -hmm. but yeah, companionship is something and co-grazing with other horses, other species is something that really can help that. And the mare is no different. She, they need social contact from other horses. They can get some of their social requirements mm -hmm. from interactions with other species, including humans. Mm -hmm. um, but if they can have social contact with other horses, that is desirable. And I think it does become so apparent when uh, a foal perhaps hasn't had that exposure to being within a, like a social group. Mm. Those messages that they would be receiving, uh, you know, like you said before about staying away or you can yeah. approach and the mouthing that we often see, when they haven't had that exposure mm. their interactions with us and then other horses are often so different yes yeah it's and 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 how the dam interacts with the foal mm -hmm. as well because some some equine mothers are quite disciplinary and they mm. will discipline their foals um, and keep them in line and say no you can't you know you see them telling them mm -hmm. off you know behave yourself whereas others give no discipline whatsoever and and that can be reflected in the outcome of the foal but of course when they are provided an opportunity for two foals to be in the same paddock together then you see that apprehension like mm. can, is it, can I approach and then they both run away and they're, they're learning those social interactive skills which all species need to learn.
no yeah. for sure and it's that tentativeness that yeah. they have in learning when can they approach and you know reading the the signals that the other horses are displaying yes. yeah and you can take that to the extreme and say that you know in those sad situations where you have an orphan foal mm. some of those can historically they're regarded as having issues behavioral issues because they don't see that they see themselves as equal to humans they don't have a, a an appropriate relationship that's not guaranteed that can be managed and prevented but that's just an example of, of when the, it, there can be challenges yeah. and it's like that establishing of the boundaries and it is the the boundaries between you know human interaction with the horse and vice versa Indeed. and then equally their their understanding of general life is yes. so different when they haven't had that yeah. shared experience yeah and it's it is also difficult because everybody has a newborn foal and they want to cuddle it <laughs> and they want it they, they, they do one needs to learn mm. distance and and also remember that it is a, a horse and it needs to have an appropriate relationship yeah. with people moving forward for it to have you know a good life moving forward mm. interacting with humans perfect no you've covered the questions perfectly thank uh, you so much you're welcome what a fascinating chat with James about how horses' reproductive systems can influence their behaviour and how we should manage them with their reproductive hormones in mind. I'd love to know what you learnt, so pop your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all things Horses Explained.